while we're in the subject of uh, house party, um, is it true that you only made four grand from house party? Yes. For the whole month or two we filmed um, as a hired actress, and it was Favorite Nation. We all made four grand. So I'm gonna start with Ghana with you because I just went for the first time two months ago, right? And so when I saw you put Akua in your profile on Instagram, you have it here uh, on the screen, we're doing this via Zoom. And I was like, oh, you were born on a Wednesday. Are you? <laughs> so, Are you? No, I'm Essie. I was born on a Sunday, I believe. Today. Sunday. Yes, Sunday, right. So uh, for those who are listening and don't know, if you go through with a naming ceremony, when you go through, uh, when you go to Ghana, you are given what is your your name. I can't remember my last name. My husband is Kwaku. Um, I forgot what day that was exactly. But um, you have been to Ghana like eight times, or is it more than that now? More, way more. More. Oh, I, would okay. say I went to Ghana. I went to Ghana probably 12 times in 2019 alone. Wow. Alone. I, um, you know, I, I don't know if you know that how it kicked off, you know, when I first went with the Full Circle Festival and I was the guest of, you know, close friends, um, Boris and Nicole, um, mm -hmm. um, Cujo Parker, Nicole Ari Parker and Bozema St. John and the whole group that went. Yeah, you know, Nita. I know Boz. Y'all left all the black people here in America <laughs> and went. I remember this vividly. <laughs> Well, left us behind, but that's okay. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I had seen them go the year before. And then mm -hmm. I was like, you know, how do they know each other? Like, not that they can't know each other, but I was like, huh, you know, I'm close to Nicole. I know both, but how do they know each other to be like hanging out in Africa together? Like what's going on? And I started stalking their Instagram for like that year. And finally, I think Nicole posted random, not randomly, this picture of her saying, can't wait to go back. And I was like, uh, don't leave me if you go you know, with the big eye emoji. And so she called me and she was like, listen, sis, for real, like we're going. And I was like, no, 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 serious, for real, I wanna go. Long story short, I went with them and my birthday is January 2nd. So it's kind of like a big birthday gift to myself, but I had no idea the gift of our history and my understanding of who we are as, as African American women and just the power that I was not walking in um, I had no idea all the gifts I was going to be given that year. And as God and the ancestors would have it, just sharing my journey and, and my discoveries and uncoveries, it garnished like 40 million impressions. And that got me alone in the trip. And that got the attention of the U.S. Embassy Ghana, of uh, the president's office, the diaspora office. And so I started becoming the face of the diaspora face of the year of return for all these different events, because that year 2019 was the year of return. So that's why I was back and forth so much. And then I started working. I, I designed projects with the US Embassy Ghana. I designed projects with the diaspora office. So all of a sudden I was working in, in Africa, not just Ghana, but it's Senegal, Gambia, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo. Like it was like all of a sudden Africa became home. Don't threaten me with a good time, right? <laughs> so that that that's how it happened. So why do you think um, you connected so much with, with Ghana? And it, this seemed to be an instant connection as well. You know, so much of my life growing up, I had never been, first of all, to the continent. And so much of my life, I, I understood when I got there. Something as simple as African dance. I've been in dance class since I was three or four years old. You know, my mom was the kind of person that put me in tap, jazz, toe, ballet, African, you know, everything, right? And I hated African dance. I was like, I don't like the music. I don't like the moves. I don't get it. Why do I have to go? And when I tell you, I got off the plane in Ghana and we went to some event and there was a drummer and this woman dancing. And I was like, I, I know that form of dance. I know those moves. And here she comes, I guess my soul called hers. Here she comes, pulls me over and starts going and I start going and I'm crying and dancing and we're saluting each other and calling each other sister in our moves. And, and I was like, this is why I learned this form of movement when I was five and six years old. So all of a sudden my life just started to make sense. If that makes any sense to you for me to say it that way. Um, I, I told myself I was gonna go, same trip. I told myself I was gonna go with the spirit of teach me and not be the spirit of I'm American who's now vacationing in Africa. 
And so I was open to the food, the language, the jewelry, the clothes. And I just think that my openness, they embraced. And they just like gathered around me everywhere I went and just was like, try this, try that, learn this, learn that. And I just, it was so overwhelmingly uplifting and elevating that it changed my life. It just, like I said, it just, it changed my life. I realized that I was a visitor in America. And I decided when I came back to America after that first trip, not even knowing I was gonna go that many more times, Jay, not even knowing I was going back that many more times. And when I came back that first time, which would have been 2020, January of 2020, I said, you know what? I have to live out loud the fact that I am a visitor in the US. I can work in the US, I can stay as long as I want, but my home where I feel loved, understood, considered, um, re re um, revered, honored, royal. It was in Africa. It's hard to explain to people who haven't been, and I encourage anybody listening, if you can get there, you need to get there because as Ooh. soon as you touch down, the whole theme is welcome home. You are not a guest, okay? And um, it was a very, it's not a vacation. I wouldn't call it that even though you do, you know, you have some fun things because listen, in Ghana, as you know, they know how to party. And I was like, okay. Oh. I, was I wasn't ready. <laughs> right, right. Listen, I was telling a girlfriend of mine in Orlando yesterday that I walked into a, a drugstore and I guess on the radio, one of their favorite songs came on and everybody was taking it down. And I was like, oh, wow. And they were going, I mean, it was like the drugstore, the kids, the women, the men. And I was like, okay, okay. And I started going. I was like, this is what I'm talking about. I was like, I love it here, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's it's true. It's like they they create a party anyway, anywhere. The beaches, yes. the clubs, I was like they they know how to turn up for sure. But I, I think it's more for us a pilgrimage. And when we were there, it was a group of ten of us, and they told us in 2019 um, that 2.1 million visitors came from the U.S. And clearly, you were responsible between you and Bozeman and everybody <laughs> for a huge chunk of those visitors. <laughs> Start calling Harriet Tubman because they were like, telling you, you're taking us home. Lean like, us back. <laughs> Lean <laughs> us back. Uh, so what was um, and of course one of the things that you is a must see when you go there is of course going to um, the slave castles, uh, going to the Cape Coast. Um, what was your experience like when you visited those things? Well, I have to tell you because we're talking about this, I'm actually launching a New Year New You retreat in Ghana this year. Um, I don't know why God put it on my plate with everything else I've got going, but you know, it's the season of overflow. So I'm just, you know, praying for sustenance and endurance at this point, trying to keep up with the, the overflow of blessings. Right. But, um, the last two years I thought I've got to do this new year retreat. I've got to offer the experience that I had. And so I'm finally doing it. The AJ Aquia experience. It'll be December 31st. It starts new year's Eve night through January 7th, the first week of the year, we're gonna go through what I'm sure a lot you experienced too, but you know, with a little AJ spin on it, but as you mentioned, the slave castles, um, I, I felt like I learned a history I never knew. I felt like I learned so much beyond the history books, you know, to, to, to touch the walls of our ancestors, to be on the grounds of um, where we were taken from, to hear the history with an African accent from brothers and sisters on the continent, from the continent. It just hit different for me um, to learn the truth of how we were enslaved, how we were treated as enslaved Africans, what happened to board us on the boat and to ship us. The fact that you and I, and most of us who are African American, are descendants of those African slaves who actually survived all of that. It just made me feel like I have got to do more than just twerk. Like, you know, I've got to like, you know, I, there's, there's more to what, I, what my responsibility is to our ancestors and what they went through for us to even exist. I have got to do something that, that makes them proud of, of all they went through. And that was my big life shift from the, the slave dungeons. I was gonna ask you, did you go to um, Ansin Mansu, the, the, the river where the last bath happened? No, we did not go oh, there. Oh. I, you got to promise to let me take you next okay. time you go to Africa or we have to time it a trip to, together. If you're not at the retreat, hint, hint, um, we, we got to go do the, 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 to walk the slave 
uh, passed to the last bath before they were enslaved. And it's, in, it's called Ansan Mansu. And even just that, to stand in the waters where our ancestors were, took their last bath, not knowing what was next for them. They had no idea they were getting ready to be enslaved. They knew something was different and wrong. They were chained together, stripped of their hair, stripped of their clothes, but they just didn't know what was going on. They couldn't communicate, different language, different dialect, everything. They had no idea what was happening. And I just, again, to, to be there to experience it. Like you said, you can't describe it. You have mm -hmm. to go and feel the water on your skin and feel the energy, feel the smells, the love of the people. I have never experienced anything like it in, in, in my world travels beyond, I just, it's Africa and every country. Like, I mean, I've got a long way to go. I've only been to six countries. I got 50 more to go, but every country I go to as different as it is, the common denominator, Jay, is the love, the love and the welcome. Yeah. I mean, it, it is going to the slave dungeons. Um, you are hit with a myriad of emotions. Um, you know, uh, we being in those dungeons and when the, the guides are describing to you what those dungeons are like, we're, we're talking about very small, spaces where you know 400 500 people were or uh, you know men on one side women on the other side and to know that this was it was a church right above it right so they heard the screams they heard all of that and um you uh, you know you you do realize that you are here for a deeper purpose because i remember when our guy told us that realized they only took the strongest only the strongest made it over and that's our descendants, right? Okay, and so from that, um, as horrific, obviously, as the transatlantic slave trade was, there should be a great sense of pride because we were not supposed to survive that. I mean, half of us were killed during it. And so those that survived the legacy that's left, it's like, that's something we could be proud of. And it just, it was a life-changing trip. So when I so saw that- yeah, yeah, it was a life changing too. trip. Yeah. And so when um, I saw that you had been as many times um, and from a food standpoint, <laughs> let me tell you, they don't play around with the spicy. I love spicy food. So I was in my and element. I don't. And I don't. Oh, you don't. Oh, Girl, God bless you. <laughs> I struggle. I struggle. I'm learning. And I find like the last time I was there, believe it or not, I went. Um, and that's the other thing, you know, I just got to say that and I don't I have to say this because I don't want it to come off like all these trips have been planned like I'm just going you know because they're not like I went I went in December 2020 which what I thought was going to be a two-week um a two-week stay in Senegal to serve at the orphanages and the main reason I did that is because one um I wasn't quite sure of what the COVID was like in Ghana I had been following and talking to friends from Ghana so I knew it wasn't bad but of course because I hadn't been most of 2020 I didn't know what their not bad was compared to LA shut down for three times right, right. I mean everybody's running around Atlanta and LA talking about it, it ain't bad so I was like okay well what's that not bad in Africa right? right so I just said well you know what let me get to Senegal because I can do that without a visa I can explore a new country because I'd never been um my focus was the 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 French speaking West Africa version of Africa anyway, because I speak fluent French. So I wanted to explore that anyway. And I got there, I got there to serve at Christmas time. And then the other countries started calling me saying, you made it, you're back. And for some reason, going back during the pandemic, it was even more attractive to them. Like that, mm. that, that I wasn't afraid to get on an 11 hour flight to come back to Africa. And I got a plethora Jay, of invitations. And that's how I traveled six countries um, from December to April because LA was still closed down by January, February, if you remember. And I just stayed in Africa. I ended up being in Africa until May and it was amazing. So I literally came back to the States from Africa to shoot my show, Life Therapy. So I literally, in the year of 2021, I can say I'm in the US working. I spent more time in Africa than, this, than, than the US this year. Blows my mind. Wow. Um, yeah, that, that you really are treating uh, the U.S. on some visitor status, uh, status right now. But yes, let's talk about your work. Um, of course, many people became familiar with you through your uh, wonderful acting career and you switched up and uh, became a life coach, uh, all, you know, wellness coach, uh, fitness coach, like all, all of the um, all of the above. So a question that I ask every guest that's on this podcast, because it is called Jamel Hill is Unbothered, is when did you become unbothered? Oh, man, you know, um, it, it actually my unbothered 
is a, it was a process. It's different phases of unbothered, but I've got to go back to the first phase. And that's when my father started noticing that I wasn't happy. He would say stuff like my eyes weren't dancing. My smile wasn't bright. And we used to have, actually have arguments about it because the truth is he was right, but I wasn't ready to face that because I honestly didn't know where to go to find this, my smile again and, and the brightness in my eyes. As he said, I, you know, I was successful. I was a celebrity. I was wealthy. I was working. It's like, what am I, what do I have to complain about? And I was honestly miserable. I was trying to fit in with the whole idea of red carpets. And for me, red carpets represented, and the funny thing is, you know, being invited to them up the ass, right? But, but for me, red carpets represented a temporary validation. And I just never believed in that. Like, you know, you call my name for 3.7 seconds and then all of a sudden your flash and your attention moves to the next person and I'm being hurried out of the way. But that's the name of the business. You do a movie and in two weeks, you're hurried out of the way. You get on the red carpet, you're hurried out of the way. And I just kind of felt like I'm more than somebody who needs to be hurried out of the way. You know, I'm more special than that. I have more to contribute than hurry up and get out of the way. And so that, so trying to fit into that, I think he saw a dimming of my light. And to answer your question, that, that was the beginning phase of my unbothered because I started to say, what happens if I chase what makes me happy? What could happen? And that's when I designed for myself first, my happy list. And it actually has become a staple tool with my clients and actually on the show. It's like, what truly makes me happy without self-sabotage, without criticism? And I got to tell you, again, first phase of my unbothered, the things I put on the list were like, you know, having a puppy, visiting friends from college um, that weren't in LA, um, walks on the beach, um, you know, you know, weekend trips away, just, just things that, that I love to do. Swing on the swing set at the playground, um, watch the sunset, things, just things. And when I put them on a piece of paper, I noticed I wasn't doing most of them because I was so busy chasing the acting, you know, making sure I was in town for the, the pilot season meant I couldn't travel from January to May and, you know, just different things. I just started to see where I was choosing to stifle my life and therefore my degree of happiness, this doing this actress thing. And I just finally said, you know, I'm going to take a year and see what happens if I focus on my happiness. And what really happened is that I started being more public with my workouts and my nutrition plan and talking about my, what made me happy. And more and more people, surprisingly to me at the time, were more interested in that than the acting chase. Because I guess everybody was doing the same thing. It's Hollywood, you're African-American, you're an actress, everybody's living the same life. And then here I am, you know, running two miles during my lunch break or drinking green smoothies instead of having donuts at the craft table. Or, you know, it's just a, just a difference in me not trying to fit in. I started to gain my happiness and more attention, which is interesting, right? Then another phase of my unbothered, I got to say, skip forward, um, my father passed. And, and, you know, he said in his last days, if you don't do anything uh, in my name, oh, please, please, please pursue this healthy living thing. Because he, he kept saying, you know, you're an amazing actress, obviously. But he would say, but your shit is saving people and changing people. He was like, that's your shit. So no one can do it like you. Nobody does it with your passion and your purpose. Promise me you'll do something with it. And so when he passed, I said, you know what? Let me put a little bit more attention in his name on that. And the network started calling and the radio station started calling and uh, you know, more celebrities started calling. And I was like, whoa. And then another phase of being unbothered was when I went to Africa. And I just learned that I can do it all if I decide to do it my way. And by that time, I feel like divinely ordained by the time I went to Africa and started feeling that way, I had already built a, a healthy living brand of probably 10 years. Um, I had been away from the acting enough that people missed me, directors, producers, because now I started to say, if I go back into the acting thing and try to do both, there's a way I want to do it. There's people I want to work with. There's directors and producers. There's certain scripts and characters I want to do. So I started talking to favorite directors and producers. And every time I said to them, you know, if you have something, let me know. They'll be like, oh my God, we've missed you, of course. 
And literally in months, I started acting again and then life coaching and everything exploded at once. So all of that to say, as you can hear, I had different phases and different steps to my unbotheredness and my gifts made room for me in that space. Uh, it was interesting as I was doing research to sit down and talk to you, uh, you know, you losing your parents at different times has such a dramatic uh, impact on your life, but both of them came out of both of them came a, a, a purpose. Uh, we saw, um, you know, you just explained what happened when you lost your father, you sort of then this entirely new pathway opened up. Mm -hmm. When you lost your mother, what was the pathway that opened up after that? Um, my mother passed of thyroid cancer and she wasn't sick very long. I mean, from diagnosis to death was about 60 days, including like a surgery. And so it, it was a very aggressive form of cancer. Um, I was an entering freshman at Spelman, so I wasn't around for a lot of it. So even that 60 days was really 30 days for me because I, I was getting ready to go away to school. You know, I, I left New Jersey for Atlanta to go to Spelman and literally October 31st is her angel anniversary. So just think about the fact that I got to school probably mid August and by, uh, by Halloween, I was going home for her funeral. So um, where that shifted was, I was there at Spelman to be a theater major with a psychology minor. And when my mother passed, my disbelief, my um, lack of understanding, my fear of my own health, because I didn't know if it was something that was hereditary, all of that shifted my, my academic lifestyle. And I went into psychology chemistry for pre-med because I just thought I don't want anyone to have to lose someone and feel like I felt without an understanding. So I, I, I launched into this, what I didn't realize was gonna be lifelong to be honest, but I launched into this space of whatever I have to do to not only understand what cancer is and what happened with her, I also want to avoid it as best I can with me and help other people. And that was my decision at 17, 18, if you can imagine. So I, so, so, you know, my, my mom's death launched me into my healthy living, how I eat, my, my, my exercise routine, and just my love of movement and peace of mind and managing stress and everything that I was researching as a scientist, you know, an undergrad studying scientist, everything I researched that could prevent cancer became my lifestyle. Isn't that deep? That was kind of out of fear, but that's, but, but again, like you're saying, losing her led to who I've been that everybody watched me become, which is, you know, again, certified nutrition, certified life coach, certified fitness. So, so all of that came out of, like, you're, like you said, me growing and elevating upon the loss. Mm -hmm. um, was your intention when you started, um, when you went into pre-med, did you intend to become a doctor? I thought I did. And okay. then, you know, it's easy. See, here's the thing. I don't know what it's like at other HBCUs, but at Spelman, um, because it's such a highly decorated institution and it's such a selective process to even be at Spelman, it's really great to walk around the campus. We say walk around inside the gates for four years, you know, toting your major and saying you're going to be this. And, you know, even now when I go over there, I meet astronautical biochemical engineers that are going to space. And I'm like, okay, what, what, you, what? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's like the thing, right? Because everybody's so intelligent. The, the GPA requirement um, the selection process is so strict, but once it became time for me to get ready to graduate, I was like, this is cool and I'm hanging, but there's two factors that are kind of throwing me off. One, lab coats are not really fly enough for me. So I'm trying to figure out like, how am I going to become a doctor and like dress the way I want to dress? That's number one. And I still wanted to do a Jackson Jack dance and a Janet Jackson video. So I was like, okay. Before I go into a hospital in a lab coat, I got to figure out the fashion and I got to dance with Janet. So we got to figure this out. And that's what made me say, okay, let me go to Hollywood. Let me just see what I can do. Let me get out of this performance bug, Janet or not. And then let's see what happens. And we all know the rest of that story. Because yeah, at that point, had, had school days happened for you yet? School days happened on my way to LA. So oh, I really got a big old God yes. I call those God yeses when you're making mm -hmm. a decision and something happens that could only be God saying, yes, girl, yes. So to me, that was a big old God yes. When, when I realized, you know, a girlfriend of mine on campus, one of my saras, I pledged Delta Sigma Theta, one of my saras was like, girl, 
did you know that Spike's shooting a movie and he's here on campus location scouting? And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, he's supposed to be here for homecoming and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, awesome. So at the time I had been this Morehouse, which is homecoming queen for the, the AU Center at Morehouse and Spelman. So I basically had carte blanche all over campus. And I was like, I'm gonna perform at the homecoming coronation. He's supposed to be there researching talent. I'm gonna perform and he's gonna put me in this movie. And that's exactly what happened. And Spike is, is, is actually, I credit he and Robbie Reed, of course, amazing casting director. They're the ones who actually gave me my first on-screen credit, which gave me my SAG card. So just think about this. By the time I did get to LA, I was a bona fide actress in a hot movie. And I'm walking the red carpet like two weeks after I got to LA as an actress in this hot movie. I didn't even realize then what it was. You know what I mean? I just was like, I had a couple of lines. This is awesome. Let's see what else I can do. But I had no idea that I was divinely being positioned to fly. Mm. Well, I tell you, um, you know, when it comes together, that's when you know it's from God, right? When it yes. comes together just so seamlessly, just like, okay, I didn't even plan for this. And look what happened, right? Won't he do it, yeah. as they say. Yes. Um, you know, as we talked about in the first half of the podcast, AJ, uh, you have dedicated a lot of time to counseling people. Uh, I saw the work that you did on couples therapy on VH1, which is loosely affiliated, obviously, with Love and Hip Hop. Saw you on there. You counseling my boy Trick Daddy. <laughs> Try to help trick through some things. <laughs> and, and my boy for years. That yes. was so amazing to me. It's my trick and joy have been my friends for years. Yeah. But it is it is amazing because so many celebrities um trust you. You know, they trust you, they trust your your counsel, your input, they listen to you. Uh, I don't know if celebrities were always your focus when you first begin to kind of branch out and become a wellness, a health, wellness, and lifestyle a life coaching brand, but why do you think so many celebrities gravitated towards you and then trusted you to improve their lives? Wow, that's, you know, that's a really awesome question. You know, I gotta tell you first, I didn't choose the business. I wasn't, I wasn't saying I was gonna step away or pivot into another brand or business. I, like I said before, I, I felt like I was just doing something that made me happy. I love to hike. I love to work out. I love um, taking care of myself. And I love the results of it. I love seeing the results of it. So it was easy to fill my day with healthy recipes and smoothies and hikes and workouts. And, and of course, a lot of my friends are, were at the time and still are in that arena. So my whole life became healthy living. Um, then I think like as you're asking celebrities, because I was working and of course that's my environment, I think they started to pay attention to one, my consistency, two, that I was getting my happy back and my joy and my brightness, living this life that I loved that I kept hidden for so long because I didn't think that that was popular, you know, in the Hollywood sector, you know, um, Hollywood, you're supposed to stay at the party all night and then go to the after party. I was like, I gotta go to bed by 11 because I gotta get up and run. And people were like, what? So, I mean, you know, I was, again, trying to fit in. I wasn't fitting in. So I think a lot of celebrities started to see where I was common enough like them in terms of the lifestyle, um, the popularity, um, understanding the, the demands of the business and, and that career and living the life in LA. But I think they noticed I was finding a way to make it work for me. And I feel like as I look back over my celebrity clientele, even though they've asked for different things from me as a life coach, it all the common denominator is them finding their place and their space and they're happy within themselves. And so I think that's what it was. Um, my consistency, you know, I mean, from house party to here has been 30 years plus. So I think that's the other thing. Um, I try to live a consistent lifestyle. And so I think that's an automatic thing to trust. You've been watching me since house party. So if I can still get in the house party outfit, I gotta be doing something right in terms of weight management, right? So I think even that, it's like, you know, I, my body hasn't changed very much. If anything, people say I look better. My energy hasn't changed. My look hasn't changed very much. And I think for people to see that is what makes them call me because they want whatever I'm eating and drinking as they say. More importantly though, can you still do the house party dance routine with Tisha Campbell? <laughs> Why does everybody think I can't do it? Like, what is that? I don't. I, I want to know that. That's the question. What makes well, What makes you think I can't do it? 
I just I just asked the question. <laughs> Clearly you can, all right? <laughs> okay. Clearly you can. Clearly I'm in my feelings about it, right? I'm like, yes, I can still do the house party dance. Um, actually better more now than ever because you know, I didn't know what I was doing then. Now I know it, it's, it's worth a million bucks if you can go down and have Megan Stallion knees. So I'm like, well, I, how about Megan got AJ knees? Because I was down there first. So, <laughs> you know, um, yes, you know. And I you can. choreographed that, correct? Yes, yes. Wow. So that's that's part of my DNA. Like, that's <laughs> not going anywhere. There's, I can't do a back, back handspring anymore, but I can damn sure do this, the, the charade house party <laughs> dance, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, while we're in the subject of uh, house party, um, is it true that you only made four grand from house party? Yes. For the whole month or two we filmed um, as a hired actress, and it was Favorite Nation, we all made four grand. And what's interesting is once the movie came out and it was such a hit, Burger King came and asked um, me play, was it me and play? I think it was play and I. Um, if we would, if we would do, if we would sign the rights to one of our scenes for a commercial and a burger, a burger King commercial became me in the window when play comes and says, we got to go get kid, kid out of jail. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. And he goes, if you come with me, we'll go to burger King. And I go, burger King. Do you remember that scene? I do. <laughs> Listen, we made more money on that commercial Jay that we made doing the movie. Wow. That's amazing. Yes. yes. Um, uh, I'm sure you you have heard that there's plans. I believe it's LeBron James's production company to remake House Party. Are you? I think they're finished. They're finished. Were you a part of the remake? I was not. Okay. I was not. Um, one, I mean, in all fairness, I wasn't asked to be part of right. it. Um, I know some people who were, and it was um, a very uh, let's just say, um, from what I what I've learned, it was a little bit unorganized in terms of how it went down. I mean, listen, a lot of productions are, so that doesn't mean anything. You know, by the time you see it on the screen, you never know the problems behind the scenes and that's called Hollywood, right? So that doesn't really mean anything, but you know, um, I just think that it's one thing to do sequels and prequels, but to try to do remakes of certain things, it's kind of tough. So I'm anxious to see what they do. Mm -hmm. But you did, um, it, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, you, it seemed like you made the decision to kind of discontinue the Shireen character. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it's fair, but, but it's, I have to say it's, it's fair with reason. Um, by the time House Party 2 and 3 came, um, and it's so interesting how these kind of answers now speak to my loyalty and my creativity. Um, Reggie Hudlin to me, gave us all such a launch, the writer producer of House Party One. He gave us all such a platform to be creative, to be ourselves, um, to create together. You know, he wasn't one of those writer producer directors who even in his first project for a feature, which House Party was, you know, a lot of writer producer directors are very, um, they're very specific about, you know, say my words, you know, do my blocking, um, make sure you do what I wrote. And Reggie wasn't like that. He was like, you know, you guys are helping me create this. So, you know, you got it's your character. You know who Shireen is. What would she do? Would she stand here on the counter? Would she sit outside on the pat on the on the uh, patio while her nails? You know, what would she be doing? And so, um, all these little things, like even on this in the scene before we go to the party, and Tisha and I are sitting outside on that little ghetto stoop. Um, and, you know, I just, draw, I had just painted my nails. Like that was a character choice. Cause you know, he was like, well, what would you be doing sitting here talking? And I was like, you know what? She'd be letting her nails dry and, you know, and just blowing and talking. And then, and then, and then, and he was like, I love that. I love that. You know, trying to be grown, you know, she was trying to be grown. So, you know, when, when, when house party two and three came and he was not a part of it, I first felt like, well, how do you have a part two of something that was so epically created by someone and they not be a part of it. Like he's he is the vision. So where do we go without him? You know, it's like going to the going to Oz without the wizard being there. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point, right? So that was one thing. And then when I met with um, George McHenry um, and uh, uh, Doug McHenry and George Jackson about the first scripts, um, I just didn't feel like the script was capturing what I envisioned the <clears throat> the friendships to evolve to. I felt like the scripts were more safe and predictable in terms of where the character relationships went. 
as opposed to where we could go. And for me, my take was, we had become such so known for our friendship as in terms of a group. I felt like we were we were gonna be the black brat pack. Do you remember that? It was like mm. Demi Moore, Rob Lowe. Remember that whole- Ali Sheedy. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. anything they did. They could go to the movies and it was, a, it was a popular movie. It was just everybody loved them and their chemistry and their friendship. I felt like we were the black version and that just was not what I saw in the script. So I just said, you know, um, I'm gonna wait. And literally once I said I was gonna wait, I booked Sister Act with Whoopi Goldberg, the first one. And um, and I wanna say, I had already done Inkwell, but it was something else. I think it was Sister Act and it could have been Assassins with Sylvester Stallone. So now all of a sudden I say no to House Party two and three, but now I'm thrust into the Julia Roberts, Whoopi Goldberg, you know, studio film on that level. So once again, it's like, oh, so God is saying, yes, girl, yes, you know, mm -hmm. to keep going. So that's what happened. See, I feel like you're evading the real story because as the meme said, the reason we didn't see Shireen anymore is because Shireen became Juanita from, <laughs> from, boy, <laughs> from baby boy. Because you went on to have Tyrese. That's what happened to you. <laughs> and Tyrese's daddy is play. And right. why are we trying not to... <laughs> <laughs> and like I said to the meme, why y'all in my business? Why y'all right. in my business? Right, right. Sheree right. disappeared because she had Tyrese. That's what happened. That's the story. That's, and I'm Don't going let to AJ fool it. you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, was it uh, was it um, creative license for you to tell? I guess it was your little brother at house party to go make the Kool Aid that you never had. <laughs> this is a true story, ladies and gentlemen. AJ has never had Kool Aid. Well, wait, wait. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's not fully true that I've never had Kool-Aid. I mean, okay. I know what Kool-Aid was. I had never, when I, when I said, I don't know what that is, and the story became I had never had Kool-Aid, okay. my, my household was more a high C, orange and high oh, C grape. You're from one of and, those households. And Hawaii, oh, oh, oh. Yes, listen, listen, and Hawaiian Punch. Do you remember Hawaiian Punch? Oh, yeah. See, that's what I grew up on. So by the time it was Kool-Aid and they were saying grape or red, I was lost. I was like, what's red? And I don't understand. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget. I went to who was still a very good friend, Keenan Ivory Wayans. I went to him and I said, what does this line mean? I've got this line where I'm supposed to say grape or red and I don't understand. And he was like, you're talking about the flavors. And he made me feel so stupid because I still didn't know what I was talking about. He said, you're just talking about the flavors. I didn't want to ask again. And so I just decided, let me just throw the line away because I don't know what I'm talking about. And it was, so that's really what the story was. I was like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But I'm just going to say it. And then Tisha said later, you know, we never say the flavors. You always say the color. And then I said, okay. She said, that's like the project version of it. And I was like, yeah, but then I say grape. I don't say purple. She was like, oh my God, never mind. Just say the line. So that, that's really what it was. I was just a high C Hawaiian, Hawaiian punch kid. Oh, so if they'd have had, you know, a Hawaiian punch of high C, you would have got it. But unfortunately, you didn't know we only go by colors. Like there is no cherry. There's no tropical yes. punch. It's, it's great red, blue. Like that's what I, we do. <laughs> I did not know that. I was like, what am I saying? I had no idea. No yeah. idea. Um, I, I, a second ago, I, I brought up Baby Boy. Um, you know, obviously for a, a lot of people, it's such a tremendous loss. John Singleton, no longer with us. Um, you know, that movie, it really, it, it's just its just a cult classic. It stands the test of time. So many themes in Baby Boy that are still uh, very prevalent today, very much applicable to today. Um, when you think about John Singleton, um, what comes, what's the first thing or first few things that come to mind? I lost my friend. Um it's still clearly a really painful loss for me um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I was in Africa when um, he got sick and um, I didn't get to, I didn't get back in time to see him. Um, but interestingly enough, even with that, it, it connected me and Tyrese and Taraji deeper over from where we were over the years after baby boy. It, it's almost like John reconnected us before he physically left us um, because we were all scrambling, trying to get to his side and trying to update each other on, you know, what was happening. Um, but John, John was not, John was just a special person in my life anyway. 
He was, he was one of the best directors I've ever worked with, primarily because he made me feel safe. He made me feel like my choices, um, like I was as good as my choices. There was never a bad choice with John as an actress. He may hone it some way or, or enhance it, but he always encouraged you to create a character. And you know, he stretched me as an actress. Like even when we got on the set of Baby Boy, I had been working with directors who would say, okay, here's your mark, here's your lighting. By the end of the scene, you're gonna go from the sink to the kitchen table. And on this line before we, you know, we call cut, I need you to be able to sit down. And I got on the set with John and I was, and I was saying like, well, what's my direction? And he was like, well, you're Juanita, you tell me. And I was like, I, I don't know. And he was like, well, you better figure it out before I say roll camera, because this is your kitchen, it's your house. You know, all I need to know is, you know, where we start and you know where the scene ends. So you, you, I'm just following you. I had never worked that way before. So I quickly got stretched into more character development, more choice making. And I thought it was, it was, it's a brilliant way to work. John also required that we not lose character on set. So even if you weren't working and you came to set, you couldn't just show up out of character, out of costume. Like if you were out of costume, you better still be Juanita when you came on set for whatever reason because he was like, we're not shooting a movie. We're telling a story and we don't need anybody coming in, interrupting the storytelling. And so I love that, you know, I love that. Um, even my castmates didn't know that I did not smoke cigarettes until we wrapped because from the table read to you know, days I, I got on set where I wasn't shooting, you know, I always had one eat a cigarette and I was always puffing. I mean, they didn't know that I was smoking cloves and cinnamon, but you know, I just, I still, you know, I had my cigarette thing going and let it hang from my mouth and, you know, I had my coffee and there's just character development. So, but even before John as a director, he was such a good friend. Um, he was my confidant. Uh, we were nerds. We were, we were, we were college nerds. So we would just talk about all kind of nerdy stuff. And he would call me and say, guess what? I saw the special on how Band-Aids were made. And I was like, really, what did they say? So, I mean, we just, you know, that, that was just who we were over the years. So um, he was my friend and I, I'm honored that I got a chance to work with him. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it was such a, um, such a difficult loss, but you know, his films, as you know, I mean, they're, they're gonna live forever. I mean, what he, yeah. what he gave us is gonna be culturally an imprint uh, until the test of time. Uh, I want to get back to, to the, to the therapy version of, of AJ. Um, but before we, before we do yeah, that, sure. I, I want to add Jamel. Um, mm. I think, I think I have to also say probably one of the reasons why it chokes me up so bad still, not only because, you know, I lost one of my closest friends in John, but I want to make sure you also hear that, you know, John was very instrumental in, in a lot of my transition and a lot of my choices. You know, when I say he was my confidant and my safety place, I was going to him a lot saying, you know, I'm, I'm bored as an actress, you know, I'm bored. Like, you know, um, when I was saying, who do you talk to about things like that? John was one of my friends that I could safely trust in my, in my truth. And so even to not have that anymore is, is painful, but, but he was one of those people that was just my, my soul place, you know? Yeah, I know. I mean, it, especially I, I think uh, it's important, I'm assuming, for you to have that safety because, as you said earlier, people will look at your life and they'll look at the, the outside and say, like, I, what are you complaining about? I don't understand, right. you know, and there'll right. be something completely going on differently that's happening on the inside. And you talk to people about this often. That's part of how you counsel and relate to people is by telling them, you know, hey, it matters what's going on in here. And, and that's why I wanted to ask you, um, I know that every case is different. I'm not talking about just celebrities. Um, but what I love about like life therapy is that you're sort of attacking things from all angles. Life therapy, which is on TV One, I believe, correct? Yeah. Uh, TV yeah. One. And so uh, it's a weekly show. Um, very, uh, it's very deep and introspective. And I think what I loved about watching it is that it forces you to ask yourself certain questions. Like it may be somebody's situation that doesn't really even apply to you. And this episode um, that aired, the first episode about the young lady with lupus, um, yeah. when you were talking about so emotionally about mother-daughter relationships. I mean, sometimes my mother and I, we have a difficult relationship. And so seeing their journey, it gave me some good intel into how, and informing me about how I approach my relationship. So, I say all this to say a very long winded way. I'm wondering 
how is it that you have such an ability to meet people where they are? Like you never make people feel bad about how they feel, even if it's, you know, <laughs> a little whatever, <laughs> but you never like you, it's just, I think that's just the gift that you have and people who are sort of in your position have, but you always meet people where you are. How are you able to do that? Well, I want to I want to point out an episode that's coming and I want to hear your take when it comes because I don't know if I do such a good job <laughs> in this episode coming, but it's an episode and it's literally in the first, like we just did the, the premiere was last night in the next couple of weeks. It's an episode where um, there's a young lady who uh, African-American who grew up in a cult, a cult mm. family. And mm. I was very unaware of the large number of, of black cults in the country. I mean, do you know this? That there's a I lot know. of black You said large number. I'm like, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know it. And when she wrote in and asked for my help because she's trying to heal from a situation in the family, I don't want to give too much away, but it's a deep situation. And one of the things as executive producer of, of, of Life Therapy, I, I made a list of what I wanted to do as executive producer for the show. And one of the things at the top of my list was I wanted to tackle subjects that were new to me. Because one, um, I wanted to stretch in front of your eyes as a person and as a life coach, but I also wanted to give other life coaches permission to not know everything. You know, um, light workers have a tendency to get a God complex, doctors, uh, lawyers, therapists. And I wanted to represent, you know, we can research in real time. And for me as a life coach, part of my technique is to say, I may not know everything, but let's journey together I'll be your accountability partner and let's figure it out together. Um, and I wanted to make sure that, that that part of therapy got shown because again, like you're saying, as an African-American community, we shy away from therapy. So I wanted to check the box. How can I show therapy in a different light where people will receive it more and not, not shun away from it like we have done as a culture, but run to it to get the extra help to move you know, through and to our better, right? So... You know, I, um, I think it's part of the gift, honestly, that um, I, I've never been judgmental. Even when people try to think that I am, I'm really being curious. Like I'll ask questions and people will be like, why, why are you bringing it up? And I'm like, no, I seriously wanna know. Like I'm blunt, I'm honest, I'm curious. I'm a science mind. So I ask a lot of questions and I gotta tell you, Jay, I'm, I'm actually amazed at how people so quickly connect and, and trust me, in the show, you're going to see, as you did last night, you're going to see real time, every episode, every single episode, when I actually meet people, it's, it's almost like the, like the opening segment, you saw the show last night, right, the premiere, each opening segment, once I meet the person, is probably about eight minutes of an edit, but we only talk about an hour in our shoot day, and so all of that that you saw me and Antoinette cover, it happened in an hour conversation. So that connection was very authentic and divine. And it happens like that for me all the time. I think that's part of the gift. And, and I'm honored to show it and share it in real time like we do on the show. When you um, are deciding to be somebody's um, life coach, what are some of the, the traits or attributes you're looking for where you feel like your coaching could help them um, that you know this ultimately relationship is gonna work? I look for the connection. Like I just said, I look for the connection. You know, this work for me as a life coach, it's personal. And the blessing for me is I don't have to do it. Thank God I've had, I, I have other careers. So um, this is a choice and it's a, it's a calling on my life, I believe. So there's gotta be a connection. There's gotta be a mutual commitment. Um, I don't wanna want your better more than you want. It. So if I'm gonna dive in and you're gonna dive in, the, the better you're after, the answers you're after are inevitable, but I don't want to push and lose sleep at night and it's not really the big of a deal for you. So I ask certain questions and I've learned to, to dive in to a certain degree to see if I can create the connection. Um, an example, for example, um, in last night's episode with Antoinette, um, when she was talking and she was telling me that her grandmother was really her everything and I knew her grandmother's name. You know, that's a point of connection. You know, I said it on purpose because I wanted her to know I did my homework. It's like with you, you're making me comfortable because clearly you've done your homework on me. You're not saying, hey, tell us your name. You know my fucking name. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like 
when someone shows an interest in you, and I'm sure you probably feel the same way, when someone shows an interest in you, there's an immediate connection um, and an immediate feeling of acceptance and safety. And so when, I, when that's received, I know that we're gonna work well together. I ask a lot of questions. And when the client, potential client at the time doesn't shy away from the questions, I know we can work together. I asked Antoinette, what's making you cry right now? And some people will back up and say, I don't know, I just, I just, and when I asked her, she answered me. So, so th those kind of questions make me say, okay, she's with me or he's with me. They're not gonna run from the work. I'm gonna dig deep. This is the first level of deep. They're digging with me. We're gonna be great together.